Hi, Angela. So nice to see you again after a long time. And uh, welcome to uh, this special edition of our uh, Trends in AI. We're so happy to have you here. Could you say a few words to uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Angela. I am a research scientist and I currently focus on low resource machine translation at Meta AI Research. So uh, today we're going to be talking about something really exciting, a new model that you helped uh, produce. So we're going to be talking a lot about NLLB. So for the audience, that means no language left behind. 200 languages with a single AI model. Uh, Angela, maybe to, uh, to start off with, can you tell us a little bit what got you fascinated with AI and uh, NLP early on and how you came to work on machine translation in particular at uh, Facebook AI Research? So what fascinated me about language is really reading. Uh, so I've always been really interested in books. I spent a lot of time uh, growing up in the, in the summer, just like going to the library by myself. And so a lot of my early work was on how do you use uh, text generation technology to write books. And so I was really interested in storytelling and creative text generation. And I focused a lot on the generation of long text. And then I you know, did my PhD in a similar area, really focusing on long text um, and creative writing. Um, and then afterwards I was thinking, okay, so I focused a lot on text generation, um, but then how can I interact it even more with my personal interests? And one of the things um, that I always really think about is my ability to speak Chinese. <laughs> so I am originally from China, I'm from Shanghai, but actually my standard Mandarin um, what we kind of think of as like standard Chinese is it, not really uh, that great. Um, so my Putonghua, it's not what I speak at home. And so I almost never get a chance to practice it. It's only if I you know, run into someone on the street and we're like trying to get to know each other, then I speak it. Because at home, I've always spoken Shanghainese, which is an oral only low resource language, but it still has at least like 10 million people speaking it. And so I was thinking a lot about, okay, like it would be really cool if I worked on text generation technology for lower resource languages. Um, right. Now, of course, like writing stories in low resource language is extremely challenging <laughs> uh, because we don't have, you know, even the ability to write like individual fluid sentences for many, many languages. And so I started becoming very fascinated by machine translation. And on the technical side, I think that a lot of it, great advancements have uh, been made in machine translation, right? Like attention was studied heavily in machine so translation. The transformer was invented to do machine translation. Exactly. Right? I always think about the transformer. So I thought like it was a great uh, conflux of two things where like one, I have a strong personal interest and a lot of personal drive to focus on this topic. Um, and second, it's like, just like a very interesting area to kind of technically dig into. And so I thought like, okay, why not work on machine translation? And then, you know, what are one of the biggest challenges in machine translation? It's low resource. Right. And so what, what are kind of your, uh, you, you worked a lot on earlier on summarization, on generalization, on actually pretty fundamental stuff with transformers. Uh, so what are kind of the main uh, learnings when you, when you start to do work on machine translation? What, what makes it uh, uh, like very interesting? So machine translation as a field for a long time, it, I always found it intimidating. Actually, when I first started at FAIR, um, there was an opportunity to work on machine translation. And I was kind of like, oh, no, 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 because it's like such an, I thought it was such an intense field. Um, but actually, you know, right now I just find it really, uh, the community is extremely strong in machine translation. Um, one of the things that I like is that there has been so much historical work done. And so there's just like huge bodies of work. When I started working on something like storage, generation, there has been a lot of work, but not as much. And so I felt like a lot of it was nascent and something to develop. Whereas machine translation, you definitely get the feeling like you're joining a very established um, field. But at the same time, you become very excited because I think machine translation, it's one of the most commercially successful applications of AI. Like now, I can't really imagine like going on vacation to a, a new country without like having Google Translate, right? right. And so yeah, yeah. that makes it feel like actually very good because you, you feel like, okay, this is something that if we improved it and if we made it possible for more languages, like it would be immediately useful for people. And so I find that extremely exciting. Yeah, it has a direct impact on, uh, on, on people using it really, right? Yeah, and uh, it has always been the dream of AI, right? Like the Babel fish and, uh, and <laughs> uh, putting this thing in your ear. It actually works now. It's amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely yeah. like a scientific, um, like a science fiction type application. Um, like I, when I, I used to read like a lot of space opera type science fiction novels. And you know, like a lot of them are about like you meet some aliens, but magically you all speak the same language or like you can communicate like there's no problem. Or, or you just speak English, the aliens, right? <laughs> Exactly, exactly. That's fascinating. So um, with uh, Meta AI, you guys just released uh, um, uh, from a very big project, right? Uh, so uh, No Language Left Behind, NLLB 200. Um, what are some of the main problems that you have tried to solve in this project? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the first thing that we try to do in NLB is really understand, okay, what is the human problem? I think many researchers, particularly in AI, we we like kind of jump to the solution, right? But we wanted to really understand the problem at hand. And so we started with interviewing a lot of low resource uh, language speakers from all over the world. And we were like, okay, like, is this technology that would actually be useful for you? Like, what do you want? And it was really fascinating. And so many people, they really echoed the fact that not having access to translation technology does block them from many opportunities. A lot of people talked about education. Um, so in one interview, you know, the person was kind of saying like, okay, like, you know, I could be the smartest kid in my country, but, you know, just like have access to a lot less uh, literature or learning material available. And so that was like kind right. of the foundational point. And then from there, we moved into a lot of kind of questions of, all right, if we wanted to solve the low resource problem, you know, what are the major challenges? And so we invested very heavily in evaluation. And so one of the things that we're uh, open sourcing is Flores, um, a high quality evaluation data set to cover all 200 languages. Because without measurement, it becomes like very difficult to, to actually make advancements. Um, and then we focus a lot on data, right? Like low resource, it's all about the, the resources are not there. That's why they're called low resource. And so we contribute this uh, small training data set, which we call NLOB seed. It's meant to be like kind of starter seed data for a bunch of different languages where none exists so that you have, you know, your sentences to kind of just jumpstart a lot of your models. And then we focus on essentially this large scale automatic data set creation work, uh, which we uh, also are fully open sourcing. And so that starts with like, okay, you know, if you wanted to find data on the web for a language that you speak, how might you do it? And so it starts with having language identification systems, then cleaning out the monolingual data, and then finally this really large scale effort in bitext mining, where we want to mine um, translations, uh, pseudo translations, if you will. And then, of course, you know, finally, then we focus on modeling where we're like, OK, you know, what would it take to really increase translation quality for all 200 of these languages um, in one model? And we have a lot of modeling techniques. Uh, we focus as well on distillation so that people can actually use these models. Right. Like if you have to wait five minutes for your translation, like that's not really like something that you're going to be using. And then finally, of course, like extensive human evaluation and also focus on translation safety. Uh, we really want to make sure that the translations we produce are actually usable by people. And so we have this big effort in toxicity so that we produce like safe translations for people. Right. And uh, of course, it depends on uh, which of those um, uh, speakers of lower resource languages were also science fiction readers like you, like what they what they try to come up with. Right. Um, so. I think uh, uh, in your uh, blog you state that NLLB uh, exceeds the previous state of the art by an average of 44% on, bl on blue score, right? I, I presume that's truly impressive breakthrough. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of measured on this new uh, uh, Flores uh, da data set, right? Or benchmark. Yeah, so for that number, previous state of the art has only evaluated on 100 languages from Flores 101. So when we compare yeah. it to previous state of the art, it's on all like, you know, there's like almost 10,000 directions, right? So that's on Flores 101, averaged across like every single possible translation pair. And then we're adding Flores 200 now. Right. And so you already touched upon some of these points. So if you look at like uh, what causes this um, this 44% uh, improvement in translation quality on average, which is 
truly huge, right? What are kind of the main technical innovations that um, that are behind these new models? And especially when you compare it to your earlier uh, models from uh, uh, 2020 um, that were also already very multilingual, right? And so I would say the two primary technical drivers are our ability to have more high quality data through this large scale mining work and a lot of modeling innovation. So maybe we can talk about data first. So we invest heavily in what is called bitext mining. And the idea is that, okay, if I want to produce translations for German, well, people have worked on German for decades. You know, you have like the workshop of machine translation, you have EU parliament data, and just a lot of uh, actual human uh, German translations. But if you want to work on a new language, um, let's say Assamese, since uh, we have a lot of low resource speakers on the team, not just me. So we focus a lot, uh, you know, every time we improve quality for some language, like everyone is like checking for their language. <laughs> um, so let's take the example of Assamese. So for a language like Assamese, there is content available on the web in Assamese, but they might not be direct translation. Like monolingual content, basically. Exactly. Basically. Exactly. And so the way our bitext mining works is that we try and uh, lift data from the web and then we try and see, okay, for all possible sentences, like really like needle in a haystack type approach, like, okay, given any two sentences, are they a translation? And so the way we do this is by embedding all of the sentences in this multilingual representation space, uh, which we call laser, and then calculating the, the distance between those sentences. But the major challenge is like, well, how do you have sentence representations for low resource languages? It's not like we have sufficient data to train those. And so one of our major innovations here is creating this model that we call Laser 3. And the idea is to start with a general model, Laser, that's trained on many different languages, but then try and specialize that representation space to extend to a new language. But you can't just train like a new sentence encoder because then your two spaces will be really misaligned. And so we focus right. on this teacher student training approach, which is able to kind of maintain the continuity of the embedding space, but be able to uh, incorporate new languages very quickly. And so with a very small amount of data, we're able to train reasonable quality sentence representations, which enables us to mine. Right. And so is in that sense the um, the new data that you use to train for these low resource languages, is it some kind of synthetic data or is it actual like uh, verbatim literal data that you have, but for which you only had monolingual um, uh, data? Good question. So we have like three data sources. So the first is like if there is data that exists, for example, biblical translation, super, super popular, right? Uh, we use uh, publicly available data sets. Uh, if there are license for uh, research use, of course. Um, the second is that we have this data set that we create ourselves called NLB Seed, and it's meant to be pretty high quality human translation data. And we actually also use that to train our sentence encoders. It, the idea is kind of like, you know, if your car is broken, you jumpstart the car kind of thing, like just to give researchers a little bit of data that humans have translated in these languages. Um, and, and that's not evaluation data, of course. And then the last is, you know, mo we use monolingual data uh, for our mining. And so we take that monolingual data and we convert it into bitext. And if you talk about a little bit more the algorithmic advancements, I, I understood that I, um, the new model is actually a sparse model. It's like a mixture of experts type of model. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so one of the major questions of encoding so many languages is like, okay, how are you going to have a model that is able to have the capacity and the quality to represent you know, all 200 languages? And it's not just the language, it's also the directions, right? Like if you think about the way people use these low resource languages, they're not just translating in and out of English, you know, like they want to translate in and out of Hindi or in and out of Chinese, like a lot of natural use cases. And so our model actually has uh, several thousand um, translation directions that we have trained with supervised data, and then we zero shot the rest of them. But this all is like a fundamental capacity problem. And so we started with training dense models, um, but we find that scaling dense models is very, is very challenging because you have so many different languages. Uh, a lot of the languages are low resource. They overfit like extremely easily, right? It's a massive problem. And so we focus a lot on sparse mixture of experts models. And the idea of these models is that they're able to, because they have expert capacity, they're able to uh, have a lot 
of capacity, uh, but then each time you produce a translation, you know, you don't activate the full model. Whereas the dense model, you know, you're activating all of the parameters, and so it's really inefficient to train and extremely slow in producing translations. And so we focus right. a lot on these mixtures. Um, but then, you know, you really confront the regularization problem because if you have a bunch of experts um, and tons of expert capacity, then the model can really easily memorize the training data. And so a lot of our advancements are in improved regularization uh, and optimization for these models. We're able to train them um, and balance between, you know, our thousands of different tasks. Yeah, and what, what are kind of the main tricks for training these uh, sparse translation models? Good question. So we have two. The first is that we uh, invest a lot in like improved types of dropout techniques. So everyone uses dropout in neural networks, but then when you switch to these mixture architectures, you know, you can add dropout to the gating, the routing to the different experts. And so the way you actually add regularization is really important. And the second improvement we have is around curriculum learning. And so one challenge you have for all of these different language pairs is that some of them have millions of pairs of sentences. And some of them we might only have 10,000. And so if you group all of them together, um, of course, your high resource languages, they haven't finished training yet, whereas your low resource languages long since uh, experience overfitting. And so we actually train in a kind of curriculum strategy where we try and estimate, okay, how long would it take for the specific direction to converge? And then we create buckets where we're like, okay, for these high resource directions, they're going to need several hundred thousand updates to converge. So let's introduce them early. And then we add in different languages on this type of curriculum. And so it really allows the languages that need to continue training to have that time and the lower resource languages to not overfit so much. Right. So they don't like um, um, you don't have uh, kind of uh, catastrophic interference between the different languages either. Yes, exactly. Actually, that was uh, something that we analyzed a lot. So I think a lot of people have the idea that, oh, you know, if I have 10 experts, then each of the experts will be specialized to different languages. That doesn't actually happen. It's more of like a dream, you know? Um, so we actually spend a lot of time like analyzing how this expert capacity is being used because, like you said, we want to encourage the model to learn relationships between related languages, like Assamese is written in the Bengali script, um, but not have so much interference between languages that are unrelated. All right. And um, so traditionally, it's been very um, hard to beat kind of uh, one task models or uh, mono, uh, uh, like uh, one language pair specific models with um, uh, multilingual uh, models, right? So even on like the well-resourced languages, does your, does your new model actually uh, have very good performance when benchmarked against purpose-built uh, pair models? That is a great question. So I'll talk about it for NLB in one second, but that's actually something that I was thinking a lot about because so people are super excited about multilingual translation, of course, but you suffer from the problem that you mentioned where, you know, at the workshop of machine translation, there's like a shared task every year and those are still won by bilingual models. And so you're like, I if I want the best model, like why multilingual? And so last year, we actually specifically confronted this at WMT. We were like, okay, the goal is to just enter with a multilingual model and see, you know, we're going to throw every technique at it and see what happens. And so we were able to actually uh, do very well at WMT. Um, Although caveat, of course, like WMT, there's not hundreds of languages, right? Uh, so we only did the languages of WMT. And the major challenge is high resource, right? Like for English German, there's so much data. English so German is data. the most important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we, we did show that you are able, even for high resource languages, um, to do very well with multilingual. So I think we won like 10 out of the 14 directions uh, with one model. Um, judged on human evaluation, okay, not blue. Um, and so that like actually convinced me a lot that like multilingual, okay, it is the way to go. And so for NLLB, you know, we do a lot of comparison on Flores, but if, uh, and you can check out our, our extensive paper on this, um, but we also evaluate, of course, on community data sets, right? Like, so we focus on um, many low resource data sets. Like there's a lot of data sets released by Masakane, for example, the African languages uh, group. But we also evaluate, of course, on WMT. So you cover most of the high resource uh, the WAT workshop, like different Indic NLP benchmarks, uh, specifically to get a sense of this quality, um, because we don't want to sacrifice quality for high resource languages. 
Okay, so you don't sacrifice it, but do you get actually like, um, does it benefit the model from training on so many languages at once? Apart from the fact, of course, that like the pairwise approach wouldn't scale very well, right? So it's an efficiency thing, but do you actually get some sort of interesting generalization cap capabilities out of training on so many uh, low resource languages at the same time? So um, when we compare to WMT, WAT, and other uh, more mid to high resource directions, we do see improvement. Not across the board, right? It's hard to win like every single possible pair. Um, but we do see in general that we have import performance improvements. Regarding generalization, it's hard for me to say that like if we train, for example, on Catalan, then we get that much better on Spanish, um, just given like the proportionate amounts of data. Uh, so I would say for the very high resource ones, we just don't drop performance. But I think for the mid to low resource, we do see some sort of generalization. Um, and we did kind of try and break down like the embedding space to be like, okay, you know, how are similar languages being grouped? Um, we actually work with uh, many linguists to try and analyze our model performance from a linguistic standpoint as well. And where is, where is Chomsky's universal grammar in your model? <laughs> Oh my god, I, I think this has always been the promise of multilingual, that there's like some sort of interlingual space or something. So far, I would say, you know, still an active area of investigation. There are some things that make a lot of sense that are model groups, but many times it's not learning, you know, like the recreation of some sort of linguistic relationship tree between different languages. And so we're still looking into that. So you have now like, a, you know, major breakthrough in accuracy. Um, uh, it's tempting to say that uh, machine translation is more or less a solved problem now. I would guess not, but uh, uh, so uh, what do you see when you when you look at the model's behavior as some sort of uh, challenging or interesting failure modes, right? Uh, there are particular edge cases or um, things that don't really work. What are some of the, the phenomena that you see that still need further work? Yeah, I think it's super interesting. So even for high resource languages, I think there's a lot of problems still. So I'll break down maybe the errors by like resource category. <laughs> um, yeah, or by so like far, most frequently occurring or whatever, highest impact. Yeah, I would say for mid to high resource languages, there's still a lot of awkwardness, like we call like translation needs. It might be grammatical, but it's just not something that a native speaker like naturally would write. And so that's still a problem. There are still some important factuality problems, like translating named entities incorrectly. Sometimes like one word will be wrong in an entire sentence. And these challenges can be difficult to identify and very difficult to fix. Uh, for our major focus, low resource, I would say there are certain sentences that are just straight up hallucinations. You know, the model can't understand the source sentence, and so it produces a hallucination, um, which is you know, very harmful. Um, often the hallucinations are biblical content, since a lot of low resource data is kind of like um, Christian Bible <laughs> in nature. Um, one of the uh, harmful errors that we really focus a lot on is toxicity. And so the setting for this is like, okay, I enter like a perfectly benign source sentence and the model generates some sort of profanity in the translation. And so this is an extremely little, poor- experience. Little Tourette syndrome, Tourette syndrome in your machine translation model. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, this is like an extremely harmful experience for the user, right? Like you lose so much trust, but it's just like so unsafe. Like you can imagine, um, you know, just seeing it is a poor experience. And so one of the things we really focus on is this toxicity. And so we actually produce toxicity word lists for all 200 languages to help people detect this. And so if you think about, you know, dialogue is an area where people are really focusing on toxicity in the chatbot um, regime, right? Where you want to have like a friendly chatbot that you're able to talk to and so on. Um, but then how do you scale this for languages that are not English? Uh, there has been a little bit of multilingual toxicity work, but all small scale. And so that's something that we invest heavily in. But it's super difficult because toxicity is very cultural, right? Like insults are extremely cultural. And so just like trying to adapt these toxicity lists and collect them such that they're culturally meaningful and actually work for your language was an immense challenge. 
And so um, now you guys have released uh, these uh, models into the open, right? Uh, in uh, at Zeta Alpha Trends in AI, we always praise Meta as being uh, probably the most open source friendly uh, uh, big tech uh, research lab. Uh, so uh, kudos for, for that. Uh, definitely a lot of very good examples. So, um, what is exactly open source now? Is it is it um, like the the data, the algorithms, the pre-trained models? Is it the full translation models that are open sourced? Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, our vision is like you speak a low resource language that's not supported, or you want to work on your own language, like you should be able to recreate everything. And so we really believe in open sourcing, like <laughs> literally everything I talked about. So from Flores to this NLB seed, we also have like a multi-domain seed version. So you can detect like if your model just performs well at translating in one domain, or if it's like actually generally a good translation model. Then we open source, of course, a script to recreate our training data sets so that people are able to train with the data we have created. Um, we also open source the libraries and the code that's required to do bitext mining and data cleaning. One of the things mm -hmm. that I think is always very interesting is that data cleaning is like an important part of most large scale papers, but then it's like exactly how did you clean your data? So we release you know, the code generally and also our configuration settings. I think that could be improved significantly, right? Like if you speak a, a language, you can tell uh, instantly if the data is clean or not, whereas we're kind of like uh, guessing a little bit. And it's like, and uh, I think it's a oh, fairly large model, right? That you guys trained, how, how many parameters does this have? About, so our, yeah, so for modeling, our final model has around 54 billion parameters, but we released mm -hmm. two distilled versions so that people are able to um, use them for many practical applications and study them at smaller scale. Uh, and we also describe our distillation approach in detail um, in our research paper. So of course, all of that is available. And then the, the code and the configurations to actually train our model. Then of course, we also release our toxicity lists and a detailed paper on exactly the human evaluation protocol. Right, so th there are like high quality uh, actual translation models being uh, open sourced here. Uh, well, yeah, of course. Yeah. We open -source are they, are they on hugging phase? <laughs> yeah, so we're working on that right now. Maybe by the time this goes live. <laughs> no, I love Hugging Face, so I, it would be super exciting for everyone to be able to use it in both the Transformers cool. library and in data sets. So you guys uh, trained this, I, I think, on a very large computer, right? Uh, how difficult was that from an engineering point of view? You mentioned like curriculum learning and it's a large sparse model and all that. Like, you know, how, how straightforward is it to train such a model? No, I mean, we are extremely, extremely privileged to have access to the research supercluster. I think that it, yeah, came out earlier this year, the, the announcement around that. And so having access to a large stable compute cluster is really useful for training our models. Um, actually, one of the things that we do break down in, the, in our work is exactly how many GPU hours is required. And so, you know, training the final model, it does require quite a bit of time, but actually, the significant time investment is all of the ablations. Like it takes us like a year to basically reach the final model. And so actually what takes the most number of GPU hours is just being able to ablate and study all of these different techniques that I talked about. And so that's where the significant investment is. Um, and we hope that by releasing these uh, very small models that people in the community will be able to experiment with them and also do fine tuning to different domains, different languages, because I think that's where you know the everyday person and even the ML practitioner will be able to use them. Uh, I think our largest model, you know, it does not produce translations fast enough for any type of real real world application. Right. And so no language left behind kind of suggest I think there are 6000 languages and you guys now have 200, right? It kind of suggests an ambition to uh, to to be adding more and um, uh, open sourcing it also for people to be adding more languages uh, from their own communities perhaps, right? So um, what do people need to do to add uh, other new languages to these models? Yeah, that is like the ultimate dream that I think if you are a researcher, you can add your own language um, to just general technology support beyond translation, like NLP in general, like why shouldn't you have a chatbot 
for your language, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's a wide variety of technologies that need to be built. Like many of the languages, uh, like how do we reach 200, right? Like we, of course, scoped out hundreds of different languages. But some languages, they don't even have keyboard support. Like you can't even text your mom in that language. Yeah. And so there's a whole wide variety of technologies that need to be built. And so I'm really excited about a lot of community efforts like Masakane, Organa NLP, uh, America's NLP, that kind of work towards that direction. And so we're really happy to collaborate with the community to add more languages to Flores. Um, we have a shared task on large scale multilingual. Last year it was uh, different language groups, but this year we focused on African. And as part of that, we actually also offer compute grants. So if you don't have access to sufficient compute to work on research for your language, you can apply for one of our grants uh, through cloud compute. And so we hope that that will help uh, supplement a lot of the kind of uh, <laughs> compute barrier um, but is, is it in, in principle possible to like take the model as it's open source and add a new language oh yeah of course you can uh, fine-tune uh, so there was a great paper from Masakane um, about a few thousand translations go a long way and in that paper they start with M2M -M actually and they adapt it to include um, different African languages and so that's definitely a really great starting point I think a lot of the languages we release still need performance improvement and so in addition to adding new languages we would love to collaborate with people who want to improve the quality of uh, translations for existing languages as well so let's talk a bit a little bit about the impact of high quality machine translation. So um, you mentioned already um, a couple of areas. Well, what, what are kind of the main ideas you guys have about the impact of high quality MT on people's actual lives? Like not from an oh, algorithm and technology okay. point of view, but like, like you know, uh, you guys have a very large platform. So there's a huge societal impact as well, right? Yeah, that's a really great question. And so you know, I love research and publishing papers, you know, like gotta love it. But one of our major motivations across the team is really to help people. And so there's two things that we really have done. One, we've partnered with our uh, production translation team. And a lot of our NLB techniques are now helping, helping translation across meta platforms. It's already kind of uh, being deployed right now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and the second thing is focus on education. So one of the things that really came strongly through our interview with different low resource communities is the desire to access information online. And so this is actually where we partner with the Wikimedia Foundation. And so they have many languages uh, on Wikipedia where they don't have uh, translation support. And so Wikipedia has this thing, it's called the content translation tool. And the idea is like, let's say you want to add an article for your language. If it exists in another language, you could request a translation for it and then edit the translation, which is much faster than writing the article by yourself. And so we worked with Wikipedia. We understood a list of languages that they don't have sufficient quality for or they don't have support for. And so um, we are actually surveying translations on Wikipedia. And we really hope that this will enable people to create information for their languages and really focus on this kind of information need, education and uh, information access uh, motivation. Mm. And uh, I mean, um, if your uh, machine translation becomes really high quality, right, it also could be applied to, you know, completely non societally beneficial areas like uh, surveillance or censorship, right? I mean, I grew up in uh, Eastern Europe uh, in, the, in the 70s, um, so I have some ideas about that. How, how do you kind of uh, see, see that, and especially um, with being open source? Indeed. Actually, Amanda Lynn Paulotta has this great article called Machine Translation Shifts Power. And one of the things that reflects upon is historically the development of machine translation was very driven during the Cold War because uh, people oh, wanted fine. to know what the Russians were saying. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think that when you develop technology, you need to understand that, you know, we think that you know, we often think like very uh, like, OK, we're only going to use it for all of these great applications that we discussed. But you're totally right that there's a lot of downsides. And that's something that we, we actually need to think through. And so one, it's really important for people in general, uh, all AI researchers to really acknowledge this and, and think this through. And two, you know, all technology has downsides, right? Like the fact that my sister is uh, 16 and can drive a vehicle on the street and could like, you know, irresponsibly uh, drive that vehicle is something that everyone needs to think through. And so this is where I think there needs to be a lot of societal uh, standard around AI. Um, and this is beyond translation, right? Like, you know, what 
can you use a chatbot for, for example, or like when will you allow AI to make a decision that really a human should be making? And so I think we need a lot more societal norms for this and also potentially a lot of regulation on like when AI systems can and cannot be deployed. And I can imagine that I, um, there was a lot of criticism actually about Facebook uh, and how a moderation policies worked, especially in low resource uh, uh, areas with conflict and stuff like that. So do you think this, this kind of work can impact some of that criticism? And I'm kind of curious how you guys as a, you know, as a researcher talk and, and deal with these kind of questions. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's extremely important that we're able to support, um, you know, all languages equally. And I think one of the things that always motivates me is the idea that many things we kind of, like we say it works. Um, okay, you know, like sentiment analysis, it works in English. Okay, and I think that you know all of these tools, especially if we use AI to do some things like content moderation, they need to work equally well in all languages. And so that's why I definitely feel like our team focuses on translation. But when we say no language left behind, I really feel that the idea is for NLP to become truly multilingual across all different types of tasks. And so that's one of the things where I hope that people look at the technology that we're building and also all of the data sets that we're sharing and they can use them as starting points to do other types of tasks as well. And because ultimately for many things like hate speech, um, people are using AI to do things like detect hate speech, detect bots uh, on Twitter, for example. And so this is where I think in order for us to really cover all languages equally, like there needs to be a focus on this and a focus on like every language matters, like every single language we need to know the quality uh, and the support that we do have. And we can't just blindly apply systems. And so that's actually why we have such a focus on quality in this work. Let's finish the interview by by looking into the crystal ball a little bit. So this is a great uh, breakthrough. You know, every uh, AI uh, uh, nerd has been uh, reading about the Babel fish for uh, you know for decades. Now now we have it. We've also all seen the Matrix. So uh, I'm not sure that uh, the metaverse is uh, has a good ending in in the in the fantasy of many AI nerds. But that's a different topic. So um, you know, like what what do you see from uh, uh, roadmap point of view as um, as as kind of um, next chapters in this in this journey for machine translation at at Meta. I mean, for me, machine translation is not solved. Like, the more I work on it, the more I'm convinced that there is a long road ahead. Uh, we talked a lot about quality issues. I think for many languages, you know, it's a journey. People love the binary, like we cover it or we didn't cover it. No, no, no. Like coverage of what quality. And so that's a major uh, focus. And the second is that I really hope that, you know, when people talk about multilingual NLP, they really value every single language. They really examine the quality and we don't just like throw all of the languages together in one bucket. And I think when we talk about developing new technologies, such as looking towards the metaverse, I really hope that there is a focus on inclusion for everybody. I don't want technologies to be developed only for English. And then it's like, oh, you know, we'll like work on everyone else later. No, I think like billions of people around the world speak low resource languages. And it's really important that everyone can access content, access technology in a language that works and is also culturally meaningful for them. So a lot of times, like, I just want to read the news in Chinese. I, I don't want to read it in English, right? Like if it's news about China, I, I don't think I should read it in English. And so, you know, we really need to develop technology that's inclusive by default. Yeah. And uh, probably also working on speech to speech translation, right? Yeah, I mean, Shanghainese, it's an oral only language. Yeah, like it is. Yes, exactly. There's t it's so much work to be done. Cool. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, explaining all of this stuff about the new models. We're looking forward to read the paper on Archive, I hope. You just have to ask Azera Alfa to, to close up the, um, the episode. So there's so much new stuff coming out on Archive, also in machine translation, right? How do you keep yourself informed in this fast progress of, uh, of AI? So I heard from everyone else that Twitter is the way to go because people tweet about their work, but I do not have a Twitter. Um, I still keep it old school. I look at those archive email digests, but I look at them like once a week at the end and uh, do a little bit of control oh, F on keywords. <laughs> All right, well, let me briefly pitch an alternative. So if you're interested to find out the latest about No Language Left Behind model or all the related work, all the sub work, uh, check it out on Zeta Alpha, a smarter way to discover and organize knowledge for AI and data science teams. Thanks so much, Angela, for uh, enlightening us on uh, this fantastic breakthrough. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to chat and also good to see you again after so many years. <laughs>